Hebrews chapter 1, beloved. Hebrews chapter 1. As we continue in Hebrews, for those who are not aware, if you are visiting this morning, we're progressing through this book initially at a rather slow pace, I must acknowledge, looking at the statements that are given in this opening sentence. And we've seen a number of things concerning our Lord Jesus Christ as God's final word, appointed heir, almighty creator, bright glory, express image, and last week God's sovereign sustainer. And we come this morning to see that Jesus Christ is God's only Redeemer. And so we'll read again from verse 1. Let's follow in the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the Majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as He hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Amen. May the Lord, as always, give us appreciation for the public reading of His Word and write it on our hearts. Let's pray. God, help us now in Thy Word. We're thankful that we proclaim a finished work and that as we come to this truth this morning, it may be of great edification as we meditate upon this afresh. Give then help. We, we know we can't preach and we can't receive the Word without the help of the Spirit. So as a collective body, we confess our weakness in this and beseech our God and our Lord Jesus that the Spirit might be sent in power this morning to save and sanctify and extend the kingdom. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last night, as I looked at Leah on one occasion, I, I noted that she had this something, I don't know what it was, all over one side of her face. It had been kind of smeared across her face and had been there long enough that it had gotten crusty and hard across her face. And so I then said to her mother, sorry Melanie, and she proceeded to do what parents often do in such instances, whatever cloth or napkin is near at hand, and it just happened to be a napkin in her hand, added with a little bit of saliva, began to wipe the whatever it was off of her face and pushing and scrubbing and trying to remove whatever it was, leaving a slight redness perhaps on the skin as she sought to take it away. But there are things that can't be taken away so easily, beloved, and chiefest among that is our sin. Our sin cannot be so easily deleted or removed, and this is a problem that perpetually faces men. We are sinners. And that sin stands before us every single day. We are faced with it, though we may suppress it, though we try to overlook it or even rename it. Talk about mistakes and shortcomings or genetic predispositions. These things are sin. That's what the Bible calls them. And the problem is perennial. It's always facing us. And as we proceed through this first sentence, we come to the statement when he had by himself <clears throat> purged our sins. Speaking of Christ, this Son of God that is elevated in this verse, he is lifted up in various ways, and we come now to see that what he did was deal with what nothing and no one can deal with, the sin of men. So as we consider it this morning, I want us to look at the source, the sufficiency, and success of this redemptive work of our Lord Jesus Christ. So note with me, first of all, the source or the origin of this work. That is the work of Him as 
Redeemer when it says that when he had by himself purged our sins. We're seeing him doing something that no one else can do. And Paul, of course, in this opening sentence is laying down a framework. We've mentioned this in past weeks. He's laying down a framework of, of various truths that will be central to his argument as he pro progresses through his sermon or this epistle. And fundamentally, centrally to it all is this aspect, the fact that there is one who purged our sins. We have considered him as the one who creates all things by whom also he made the world, the end of verse 2. Or as last week, the one who upholds all things by the word of his power. We're seeing works of creation and providence. These are mighty works, tremendous truths, getting our heads around the fact that God, by His Son, made all things out of nothing, and that He sustains all things continually every second of the day. We come then to consider this fact that really the apex of creation and providence is the atonement, that Christ by Himself purged our sins. These mighty truths, doctrines, creation and providence joined together in the cross in a way that is presented as a central act of all human experience. It comes out clearly in various passages in the book of Hebrews, just one example, the fact that the cross is is central to this. For example, chapter 12, verse 2, we are to look on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And you see a similarity right there in that text, and what is presented for us right here, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. This is what's on His mind. He wants us to grasp the fact that this Jesus, the Son of God, purged our sins, dealt with our sins, and the way He did so is by the cross, the cross that was set before Him. In Hebrews 9, we are told that Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And this gets worked out, weaved into the fabric of this epistle in ways that are uh, somewhat repetitive, but essential for us to understand as they're tied into the various arguments that are presented. I want us to see in this source of this work, the, the origin of the work, first of all, the implied condition of men. This statement that He is purging our sins implies the condition of men. It implies the fact that sin is a real experience. The word that is used for purge, purging or purge our sins, uh, catharismus, has, is related to the idea of cleansing or purifying. Christ came to deal with the defiling effects of sin. Now, that's not what society says. Society today has so reframed sin so that it doesn't defy it. It's just who you are. And in some ways, as we're far too well aware, it is actually elevated and promoted as good. And so, we've come to a stage in our own experience, Isaiah chapter 5, when good is called evil and evil is called good. But Christ came to deal with sin, and that sin defiles. It makes men unclean, and they have to be purged. The sins have to be purged from them. As I say, we've, maybe we'll go to Hebrews 9 just for a moment, just to see these truths laid out for us. In Hebrews 9, for example, verse 14, and of course I can't take time here, but just noting this idea of cleansing that works its way through the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 9, 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? We've already made mention of verse 28, just so you see it there at the end of that chapter. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. He's, he's, he's bearing them, and he's, he's bearing them away. That's the idea. Chapter 10, verse 2, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? because that the worshippers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sins. It's this 
need to deal with sin that defiles, to be purged, to be cleansed. And what is interesting, just as really as an aside, is that as you go through Paul's epistles, many of them have lists of the, the vices and the defiling sins that were common in, in the churches and in the community. And so you have Galatians 5, you have passages in Ephesians and Colossians as well, and, and, and Corinthians also. We have lists of, of vices, of, of, of the things that were going on, the various aspects of their unclean living. You don't really have that in Hebrews. If you were to go through those passages and then ask yourself, does that have a reflection in Hebrews, you wouldn't find it. Now, there's reference to adultery, and there's reference to covetousness, but you don't have this list of sins, the works of the flesh, as they're referred to in Galatians 5. You don't have that in Hebrews. The primary sin is unfaithfulness to God. The primary sin is unbelief as it, as it comes in and and they, they begin to be led astray to, to deny Jesus Christ and, and to show their, their lack of loyalty to God by their loyalty to the Son. That's the primary sin that is being dealt with. But the fact is that when purging sin, the implication is all men are sinners. We know this. We know this. Romans 3, verses 10 through 12, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. We all like sheep, Isaiah 53 says, we, we've gone astray, we've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is, this is the inescapable reality for all of humanity, regardless of where we're from or our upbringing. It is summarized again in Romans 3, 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the Ephesians are told, they, they know this, but Paul lays it out clearly in Ephesians 2, verse 1, You hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's where you were. That's where all men are by nature. So the preacher in Ecclesiastes 7, 29 says, Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. They go after their own ways. They're inclined to their own carnal desires. God made man upright, but man goes his own way. All men are conceived in sin. Psalm 51, verse 5. So, the implied condition of men. If you're here this morning, you cannot escape the reality of sin. Your conscience testifies to the reality. And though you may try to reteach and train your conscience so that the things you do, you try to reframe so that they're not so bad, you cannot escape that nagging sense that you aren't as good as you might profess to be. Even if you reshape what is good and what is not, even if you live a law unto yourself and ignore the law of God, and you reframe the laws to live by it, do it yourself, you will find you can't even live up to your own standard. So you'll be upset at people when they lie to you. How dare they? Or if your spouse is unfaithful to you, how dare they? But you find the same corruptions in your own heart. There is the implied condition of men, but there's also the evident love of God. The evident love of God. Why should the Son of God deal with the sins of men when He had by Himself purged our sins? You see here, just looking at the passage as He's, he's dealing with these various aspects of his person and his work. This, this is part of his work. And this, this, this work invades time, comes into history. When the Son of God is, is born, when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. This, this is this historical event that he is referring to. Upholding all things by the word of his power, then he also has done this. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down, and we'll get to that in due course as well. But why? 
Why, why purge our sins? Why not leave us? Why not leave us to go and face the consequences of sin ourselves? Why not? Why intervene? There are different ideas as to God's intervention and the reasons for the cross and so on. Augustine and Thomas Aquinas believe that God could have forgiven sin and saved the elect without the cross. But that's not what we believe. That is not what we believe. We believe, and we believe it's borne out by statements such as you have right in this very book in Hebrews 9, 22, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. We believe that the dealing with sin demanded the atonement. That's not to say that God had to save anyone. It's not my point. I'm not saying that He had to save. But if God is going to save, and since God has saved, it must be in the way that it has happened by means of the cross. And we're going to learn, when we come to chapter 2 especially, why this was so vital then that, that the Son of God take our humanity. For example, look at chapter 2, verse 17. Chapter 2, verse 17 of Hebrews. Wherefore, in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, like taking our humanity, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. It has to be this way. He has to take humanity, and he has to be the sacrifice, the substitute for sin, as is reflected in the cross. But again, we ask the question, why? Why? Why not leave us? Why would God look at us and our rebellion and our mess and decide to purge our sins, since it demands He takes our humanity and demands He be a substitute for our sin. Why? We cannot escape the plain, though in some senses incomprehensible truths of passages like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, I know you can give an answer in terms of he did it for his glory, and that's the ultimate sense, of course. But when we are looking for a motive, when we are trying to figure out, okay, there is the implication that man is sin. If he's purging our sins, the implication is man's a sinner. But the, then why? Why would he do this? The love of God. The love of God. Paul writes in Romans 5, 8, God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is, this is the love of God expressed. Why? Why you? Why you? Why me? Why would God take on flesh and be a substitute for a sinner like me? He so loved. And I do not think it wrong for us to put ourselves into texts like that. God commandeth His love towards me. <laughs> towards me. And while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. I don't think it's wrong to do that because Paul does it himself in Galatians 2. It is the love of God that demands Christ die upon the cross in order to save do not forget it. You could have been left to perish. If this statement is not here, if He is all these things, if, if, he is, if He is the one who is the heir of all things and made the worlds and is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of His person and He upholds all things by the word of His power, but He doesn't purge your sin, there's no hope. You're left to perish. You're left to suffer the consequences of your rebellion. And you're hopeless. 
You have no hope whatsoever. But herein is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And that's what Paul's arguing here. The same thing as John is arguing, 1 John 4.10. He loves. That's why He had by Himself purged our sins. That's why we have this truth. That's why the whole of Hebrews is undergirding the, the, the importance of this above everything else. So we've considered something of the source or origin of this work. Let's secondly consider the sufficiency of this work, the sufficiency of it. The apostle is declaring the greatness of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We know that. And they would reject much of this, but especially this, when he had by himself purged our sins. As Paul said elsewhere, 1 Corinthians 1, 23, that this unto the Jew, a stumbling block. The cross to the Jew is a stumbling block. So he is dealing with largely a Hebrew congregation, encouraging them. And he begins, he begins, his first sentence includes that which was a stumbling block to everyone who was trying to encourage these believers away from Jesus Christ. He, he lays it out immediately. Out of the gate, he is saying, <laughs> I'm not running from this. There's no way to get the unbelieving Jew to accept the cross. It's a stumbling block to them. But you have believed this. It wasn't a stumbling block to you. To you, it made perfect sense. At some point in your existence, the reason why you're found in this congregation, the reason why you're here, the reason why you're in the context reading this epistle is because... Your heart was smitten and filled with a sense of gratitude because the Son of God purged your sins. Putting the redemptive work of Christ amidst Christ's creative power and His sustaining power clearly indicates that this is no ordinary act of God. When you look at these things, when you tie in all the, the statements that we have considered thus far and yet to come, these aren't, these aren't ordinary truths. These aren't secondary issues. These are huge, monumental. And so the coming of Jesus Christ into the world is not just an example. It's not just something to say, well, there's a message in that for us. Let's make sure we learn the message. <laughs> no, this is, this is central. If the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin, this statement has no business being here. The fact that the Son of God who has all these characteristics of being the brightness of God's glory and the express image of God's person. If it, if it was possible for us to be saved by the blood of bulls and goats, why then should this ever happen? This is not just an important doctrine. This is the central doctrine of all. To make the world perfect is a miracle. To redeem a fallen world is the miracle of miracles. And that's what we have here. When I was thinking about that, I then came across A.W. Pink, who says, the putting away of the sins of his people was an even greater and grander work than was the making of the world's or the upholding of all things by His mighty power. His sacrifice for sins has brought greater glory to the Godhead and greater blessing to the redeemed than have His works of creation and providence. And I read that and I said, thanks for agreeing with me. Thank <laughs> it is. This, this, this is. this is it. And as I say, all of these statements and truths are critical to the argument throughout the epistle. But, but here, here and what we'll deal with next time, are, are fundamental. It's the foundation. It is... It is the, 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 the 
the most primary argument of what he is weaving out. Of course, the fact that this one who has all this glory and is, is the express image of the divine person and so on, and the fact that he purged our sins has to cause us to step back and marvel at gratitude, amazement of what he has done for us. So as we consider the sufficiency of this work, note with me a couple of things. It is full. It is full. When he had by himself purged our sins, it is a full work that he is doing here. And that is seen in first the implied, another implication, incarnation. The statement takes for granted the incarnation. This one who is the heir of all things and made the worlds. When he purged our sins, it implies the incarnation, which, as I've said already, gets weaved out more in chapter 2 and beyond. But also, it's seen in the intended depiction, purged our sins. What's, what's he referring to when he talks about purging our sins? Does this have some, does this trigger some memory in, these, in the minds of these Hebrews? Does it? Are they brought to think about something? Of course they are. The expression recalls the work of the Jewish high priest, especially on the Day of Atonement, purging sin. It's taught to us in Leviticus 16. That I can't take time to turn there, but you may make a note of verse 30 particularly. That this Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, this day in which the entire nation was called together to watch the activity of the high priest on their behalf, it said in verse 30, For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse or purge, that ye may be clean or purged from all your sins before the Lord. That's the message. And so, this day, this event, well, again, it will come out. We'll get to Hebrews 9, and, and the Day of Atonement will, will frame a big part of the argument that is made by the apostle. But the book is, is laying out this fact that there's the, this purging of sins. This isn't a new idea. This isn't a new concept. This is the Son of God taking the place of what everything previously was just pointing towards. Or as chapter 10, verse 1 says, a shadow of good things to come. The Day of Atonement was a shadow of good things or better things to come. It pointed forward. It taught the essential message of what the Messiah was going to do. And the Messiah was going to do what no Levitical priest could do, and that is be both priest and sacrifice. What a sobering day it was for those Jews. It's hard for us to kind of step in there, but when you read the language of Leviticus, it is clear that God wants a certain soberiety upon their minds. It's the only time that a fast is demanded by God. It's the only time that God demands His people fast that day. He is using even that to, to focus their attention, to bring them to a realization of the, 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 the central message of that day. And they are being weaned off normal and necessary things so that they can give all of their attention and all of their focus to this, this sobering day in which he says, afflict your souls, afflict your souls, watch. And there, uh, unlike other occasions, the burnt offering and all the rest, where they bring the animal and they participate, they kill it, and they, there's all their involvement of what's going on. They, they're laying their hands on the head of some creatures and the transfer of guilt and substitution, all of that they're involved with. On the Day of Atonement, they don't do anything. They show up and watch. And they watch their high priest. They watch him. First of all, because he is a sinner, he needs to be cleansed and purged from his own sins. So he, there's a sacrifice of a bullet for his own sins. And once he's been purified and cleansed and he's ready to somewhat fit the type of our Lord Jesus Christ, then he takes their two goats, and one is slain, the blood of which is sprinkled on a place where the priest had only the right to enter once the entire year. And the warning, if you go back and read Leviticus 16, you'll see that, that, that there's a warning of death if they don't do this right. Once a year, they enter in, sprinkle blood, 
The other goat is preserved alive. The hands are laid upon it to signify the transfer of guilt, the sins that are laid upon the substitute, and it is taken out into the wilderness, called the scapegoat. Away! To depict what we were singing about in Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. And so it's all a picture, but it's a picture of what? It's not something that can save this, this act of Aaron and his sons and the Levitical priesthood and the, 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 the sacrifice of the creatures themselves cannot deal with the problem of your sin. And so in the first sentence, Paul gets to the heart of it. It's, it's this one who purged our sins, who actually made an end of sin. And so as they would think about the Day of Atonement and all that was tied into that, they would remember Reading this, when he had by himself purged our sins, they're remembering, yes. He, he, even in the language, when he had by himself purged our sins. The Levitical priest couldn't do that. I think that's the sense of when he had by himself. It's not the sense that he was alone when he was doing it. There's a sense in which that's true. His disciples forsook him and fled, and there's a sense of him treading the wine press alone, all of that may be true. And it's, I don't think loneliness is, is what is in the mind of the apostle as he's writing, by himself purged our sins. I think the sense is that by himself he purged our sins. That is, the priest took himself. The priest, the Levitical priest took a creature and by that creature sought to give a representation of the purging of sin. But this one takes himself and he makes himself an offering and he lays down his life for the sheep, John 10. That's the sense of by himself. But he purges sin and all that memory to the Hebrews, all that years from their infancy, they would have it put before them and they would be instructed in Yom Kippur and, and the importance of it and the significance of it. And as they came to faith in Christ, it got filled with even greater meaning. And here's the point. With all the glorious messaging of the Day of Atonement, they knew, they knew, it can't deal with my sin. They're being tempted. They're being encouraged. They're being caused to consider maybe we should go back. But go back to what? Go back to ceremonies that can't deal with their sin? Go back to religious rites that can't get to the core of the issue? No. No, we're going to go back to a priesthood that has to, to take another and sacrifice it and do it all the time. And every year it has to be done and fulfilling all that. No, no, we can't. Like, as I say, right out of the gate, the apostles like, why would you ever get your eyes off Jesus? He is the author and finisher of our faith. It's not only full, it is final. It's going to be Another major argument through Hebrews. I'll turn for just for a second to Hebrews 7. Hebrews chapter 7. Verse. We'll read from verse 25. Well, we can read from verse 24. This man, because he continues ever, he's noting distinctions here, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He's able to do everything that's needed. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins, and then for the peoples. For this he did once when he offered up himself. He did it once. It is a final, therefore, purging. A final purging. This one who purged our sins performed the work of purging our sins. I mean, even logic. Even logic. I mean, if you're following the flow of the argument, listen. So, he is God's appointed heir. 
He is the one who made the worlds. He is the brightness of divine glory. He is the express image of divine person. He upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sin, just stop for a minute and ask yourself, does he need help in anything else? Is there something coming up short in him making the world or him being the brightness of God's glory, the express image of his person, or upholding all things by the word of us? Does he come up short? No, no. He doesn't need outside input. He doesn't need additional work. He, he is doing this. He is doing this. So, logically, before you even begin to understand all the weaving of the argument, when he purges our sins, you have to come to the conclusion without the addition of your works or mine, without the contribution of a church or a priest or Mary or whomever it might be, he, this one, purged our sins. And it is the it's an act of uttermost folly to think that in some way we can add to it. We do not. Nor can we. Here is one. Because of his two natures, God and man can do what no other could do. Gehardus Voss says, Christ can be priest and sacrifice at the same time because even where his human life enters into death, his divine life still continues for he offered himself through the eternal spirit, Hebrews 9.14. Here's a priest doing something that no one else can do. You're, you're, you're in a completely different category here, mixing and trying to substitute the person and work of Christ with the beggarly efforts of the Levitical priesthood doesn't, doesn't make any sense. By making purification for sins, the Son accomplished something no one else could achieve. Again, Voss says, according to the epistle to the Hebrews, Christ is the true, only, eternal, kingly, self-sacrificing, atoning toward God, substituting an actually guilt-removing high priest. Which brings us finally then to consider the success of this work. The success of it. When he had by himself purged our sins. It's giving the sense that this is a done act. That's the tense. That's what his argument. This, this has been done. He has done this. He has purged our sins. This work has been accomplished. And as we consider the success of it, note first, successful in who it was for. He purged our sins. He purged our our sins. Christ came to save, not just to remove hindrances to salvation. And that's what some ideas of the atonement boil down to. When you have an idea that Christ died for all in the same way, you're left with the conclusion, you're left to concede that in some areas, he failed. He purged our sins. He actually purged our sins. If you say he, he purged them, but you don't receive the benefits of that purging, you cannot claim he purged them. And this is borne out. I can't get into any argument of length here, but John 6 38, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Yes, because the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Substitution. He is in the place of his people. He is purging the sins of his people. There is no getting around this. John 10, 26, ye believe not because you haven't quite understood 
though. <laughs> Ye believe not because you're not of my sheep. If you take time to think about that statement, make sure you don't flip it the other way. You're not my sheep because you, you don't believe. That's what people imagine. You're not my sheep because you don't believe. But that's not what Jesus says. You're not my sheep. That's why you don't believe. So who it was for? He purged our sins. It's a family text. And it's Christ doing a work for his people, for his family, for the many members in one body. He's doing it for them. He's doing it for them. He's not doing it for those that are maybe found around the body, are connected. You know, some people, listen, some people in the church, you know what they're like? They're like jewelry on the body. They're like rings and necklaces, and they, they're pretty, and they may have some sort of aesthetic use, right? But they're not the body. They are not the body. And people sit in church. I, in fact, pastors love it. They fill their church. They fill, they fill their congregation with people, and they're all just... They're all just necklaces and gold and other forms of jewelry. They're just, they're just outward trappings. This stadium's filled with goats who've never, never met with the real Christ. Because maybe they've never even had the gospel put before them. Christ purged our sins. Do you know you're in there? Do you? Do you know you're in there? You can know, you can know it, whosoever. You walk in, he'll not cast you out. He'll not reject you. If you want it, you can have it. Believe in the Son, that he purged your sins. But also successful, not only in who it was for, but in what it accomplished. Oh, what did it accomplish? It purged our sins. <laughs> All of them. You remember, you remember that part in Daniel where the, the three Hebrew, sometimes called children, but the, he, the three Hebrews are put in the fiery furnace? You remember that the Son of God is right there in the furnace with them? And it's said of them, it's said of them that they didn't even have the smell of smoke upon them. That such was the preserving work of the Son of God with them. It didn't even have the smell of smoke upon them, having been in that furnace. That, beloved, that is like your sin if you're in Christ. It doesn't even have the scent anymore before God. He doesn't, there's not even any part of it. He has purged, cleansed, removed, dealt with fully and finally your sin. There's not even the smell of it. Past, present, future sin, all put away because He, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Redeemer of the elect, has purged your sins. And this, listen to me, this is the only purgatory in the Bible. It's the only purgatory. That's where the idea of purgatory comes from. The need for purging, cleansing. And the Roman Catholic Church has said, this is a necessary part before you get to heaven. That you can live the best life, yeah, even be a pope. And at the end of your life, you'll go to purgatory and you'll be there for a time, being purged, being cleansed, being fit and ready for heaven. And it's a lie. It's a lie. They still preach it to this day, and it's a lie. And I'll tell you, you'll, you'll be hard pushed, even in Greenville, to find a church that publicly denounces the false gospel of Rome. You will. But this is a false gospel. It is a false gospel. There is one purgatory that happened at Calvary. It's the cross work of Jesus Christ when he had by himself purged our sins. He dealt with it in full. And those in Christ need not fear a further purging, need not fear an ongoing cleansing under some divine judgment before they're finally acceptable before God and enter into heaven. No, this one that you've believed, dear Christian. Dear Christian, let it bet into your heart. He purged your sin, all of it. He dealt with it in full, not half-heartedly. Oh, and I'll tell you, 
you ever in the providence of God have to go and find another church, feel free amidst other questions to ask, do you preach against Rome? Do you preach that the gospel of Rome is false? Do you tell your people that it's a false gospel? And if they don't, go elsewhere. Because they're playing in to the deception. You have to denounce. You have to denounce the false gospels. And there's no more dangerous false gospel than the gospel of Rome. She still tells her people, oh, pity their souls. Go and tell them the true gospel. Use this. Take them to this text. Ask them, what do you think about purgatory? How do you feel about that? And then bring them here and say, do you really believe the Son of God went to the cross and purged our sins and came up short? That, that there was, what sins did he actually purge? And what sins has he yet to purge? What's he dealing with there? Did he do half a work? Did he do 99% of the work and 1% suffering for you? Ask your priest, how long are you going to spend in purgatory? How long is Pope John Paul II have to be there with all of his works? They don't know. And so they go and they put money in and they hold masses for their family members. Pity their souls and pray for them. Because it's a direct contradiction of the only purgatory in the Bible. The cross of Jesus Christ, when he had by himself purged, suffered purgatory as it were, for our sins. There is no need for an additional purgatory. Your sins, friends, those of you who believe in Jesus, your sins have been dealt with on the cross of Jesus Christ. If this one, again, go back up and look at the one we're dealing with here. If this one can't deal with sin, who can? And if he can't do a full job of it, what hope of you? Oh, this, this is the glorious message of the gospel. It is. This is the heart of this book. And he had by himself purged our sins. Why look elsewhere? Why look on to another for your faith, for your hope, for your salvation? Let me ask you here this morning, what are you looking to? What are you trusting in? Boys and girls, what are you trusting in? Where's your hope? Older folks, some of you, you may have been part of church for your entire life, but if you've got it into your soul, maybe you're still living in a way like, like, like an in-life purgatory. You're trying to impress God. You're, you're, you're trying by your own activity to show God how, how, how good you are, how obedient you are. Now, don't get me wrong, there's a place for obedience, but let, let us get the gospel deeply rooted into your hearts. There is no, no amount that you can offer to God that will anyway satisfy His demands. The only one that can satisfy is Jesus Christ. So you get that into your heart. He has satisfied everything. Everything, preacher. All my past sins, yes, all of them. The things I'm wrestling with right now, yes. The future things that no doubt I will be guilty of, yes, yes. Do you see Him? Do you see him there dying on the cross for your sins? Do you see him with the eye of faith purging your sins, all of them? That's what you need to see. Oh, that Christ died. That's history. Christ died for me. That's the gospel. And that's what you need to see. There he is purging my sins. He is purging all my sins. They're all being washed away. Yes, I say freely, nothing. I was said again, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Why? Because he purged, cleansed, removed all my sin. In heaven, I was thinking about this, and you correct me if I'm wrong. I was... In heaven, the only evidence of our sins will be on the visible wounds of Christ. And in the memory, to some degree, I don't know how much of his people who sing 
unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Purged our sins. Do you believe it? Have you received it? Amidst all the challenges of life and the uncertainties of your future, do you have a steadfast, concrete rest? I know whom I believed. And I am persuaded. Why am I persuaded that he will keep me and present me faultless on that great day? Why am I persuaded? Because he by himself purged my sin. Praise his name. Let's bow together in prayer. It is very possible that there is someone here who's not saved. I want you to know that on the cross of Calvary, Jesus, the Son of God, took all the guilt of all the sin of all those who trust in Him. Do you trust Him? Do you believe in Him? Have you received forgiveness of sins and a pardon that is full? If not, seek it now. And if you don't know how, be sure to let us know. God, I pray, fill our hearts with gladness, the gladness of the good news. My Jesus has done all things well. He has triumphed over death and hell. That's the news. And we praise Thee that He has put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself and given a sure hope to all that believe. Give grace to sinners, that they might believe. Give grace to those that believe, that they might believe even more the magnitude of the work of redemption and the power of the blood of Jesus to wash all sin away. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Amen.